Hey everyone, it's Nathan here. Thanks for joining me again. Today I'm going to talk to you guys about data in the opiate crisis. Um, we have a new bill that's expected to be signed into law later today by President Donald Trump. Um, that bill is called the Support for Patients and Communities Act. It's HR 6. Feel free to Google it uh, and check it out, read all about it and see how it's going to uh, impact you explicitly. Um, so aside from talking about the benefits of this new bill, I'm also going to share with you a free, uh, a few free data sources uh, and dashboards that may be a great benefit to uh, you or your organization to help gain a better understanding of uh, the impact of opiates on your community. So we'll start with key benefits and I will put these up on the screen for you. So. One of the biggest benefits about this is that we're going to finally start to see some serious funding uh, directed towards combating uh, the opiate epidemic. Another great benefit, of course, is we see a team approach to this and that we have both parties coming together uh, and working. It passed um, with a, a 98 to, uh, to 1, uh, yay to nay, and then a 1 absentee. Uh, and that was uh, Ted Cruz, who's out campaigning right now. The one nay was uh, a gentleman from the state of Utah. Um, I don't know what the specifics were for him to say, say nay. Um, there are some people who do believe that this bill does not go far enough. However, it does uh, at least get us headed down uh, the road, which is always a positive. So one of the first benefits uh, that is key is that it's going to allow the Medicaid benefits of a juvenile that is incarcerated to continue so they can continue to receive the health care and more importantly, the, the assistance that they will need uh, so that they don't continue uh, down the pro uh, path um, and uh, the addiction just um, continues to sit there and they spiral out of control. So, so that is a good benefit. Another one is that foster children that are enrolled in foster care are in the Medicaid program prior to their 18th birthday um, would be eligible to keep their benefits uh, up until their 26th birthday. Um, another uh, key benefit is that we will see uh, CMS to issue some guidance on neonatal um, abstinence syndrome. And not only will they have to issue some guidance, um, but we will have um, some requirements placed on them to study and um, the effectiveness of this and the, the government accountability office is expected to oversee these studies. Um, of course, we will see uh, funding that's authorized for the local uh, public health laboratories to detect fentanyl and other synthetic opiates. Now, that was discussed widely throughout the bill, which was not just prescribed opiates, but also synthetic opiates, uh, street drugs, prescriptions, um, drugs that were also imported into the United States illegally, um, and then those that are, of course, are manufactured um, here in the U.S. illegally. And then uh, one that ties most likely to EMS was um, alternative pain management protocols in the emergency department. And the reason why I say this ties to EMS is because most likely whatever they come up with will trickle down into EMS. Now, EMS isn't referenced specifically in the bill, and it doesn't look like there's any funding that will be directed towards fire EMS agencies to help deal with the ever-growing uh, opiate crisis. Um, however, there could be some benefit to new protocol development as uh, fentanyl is one of the leading uh, pain management medications used by most uh, EMS agencies and is also utilized in quite a few uh, RSI protocols throughout the nation. So there are some benefits to this bill. Um, hopefully we'll see uh, some uh, progress made uh, with this epidemic. Now, as far as EMS specific data, uh, the people over at NIMSIS did develop a, a Naloxin administration dashboard. Um, and this is cool because it, it breaks down um, when it's given and, and, and the frequency and, and the types of patients that it's given to, and also the top complaints um, that are received into 911, as well as the top 15 impressions uh, by EMS. And I'll, uh, of course, link up to that. But as you can see, there has been an ever-growing trend of, of uh, Narcan administration. And it, and it started in 2014 with the data source. And then we saw a dramatic increase in March of 2016. Um, huge increase. 
And, and we don't specifically know why that um, huge increase uh, occurred, um, but it is there. Looking through the data, what we do see, and this is kind of neat, is that um, males uh, seem to be the larger proponent, uh, not larger proponent, but the larger utilizer of opiates um, at 61% compared to 38.9% uh, for females. And I looked at a couple of states specifically through state-specific data on their websites, and I saw similar occurrences. So it's not just a national thing. It's, it's at several states where men are utilizing more than women. Another thing that we saw was the age demographic that it primarily uh, impacts. So this is impacting uh, younger adults. Um, so it starts uh, to really climb uh, at the 20 to 24. It peaks at the 25 to 29 year olds. Uh, the next highest demographic is 30, 34 year olds and it starts to taper off. But opiates are impacting the age range of, of 20 to uh, 64 uh, years of age, which is quite a widespread of, of people out there. Uh, of course, most incidents that EMS responded to do occur um, at night. So the later in the evening, the higher uh, the utilization does increase. And um, some positive news that comes out of this is that it looks like May of 2018 was the highest uh, number of incidents that NIMSIS has. And then it started to go down from there. So we don't know if this is because not all of the states have submitted their data or if because we have started to see a decline. Um, seeing a decline would be, would be great, but this also could be because EMS has also started to uh, gain a better understanding of uh, Narcan in, in EMS protocols. It used to be that Narcan was given to any unconscious patient as part of the you know unconscious unknown uh, cocktail of, of D50, of thiamine, and then uh, of Narcan. Um, it was almost as if Narcan was utilized as a way to determine if the patient truly had taken an opiate or not. Um, so maybe we're seeing a shift away from that. Scrolling down on this dashboard from NIMSIS, what we do see is that most of the Narcan is given by EMS providers prior to arrival, uh, or sorry, given by EMS uh, providers. It is not given prior to arrival by uh, first responders or by um, bystanders. So I know there has been a big push to arm uh, law enforcement officers and to sell other people or bystanders with Narcan over the counter, but as far as the NIMSIS data shows, um, it's still paramedics and EMS personnel that are primarily giving this uh, medication. The, the top 15 complaints, the top three, were overdose slash poisoning, unconscious fainting, and then cardiac arrest slash death. And then um, the EMS agencies reported the number of, uh, three impressions or the top three impressions that went alongside were at number one, change in mental status then opiate abuse, and then poisoning by unspecified uh, drugs. So all three of those kind of go together, and it might just be the preference of the person um, completing the documentation. So moving on from the NIMSIS data, we do know that several states offer their own dashboards. New Jersey has some of the most robust um, data collection out there, and they make it available to the general public. Uh, so you can go check out that. Of course, um, Texas has one where I'm from, um, but the data kind of lags behind. Um, the dashboard's only updated through 2015, uh, which is kind of sad. Uh, so some states are well uh, more ahead of, of, of others. Um, another great data source happens to be um, the county health rankings, which is through the Robert Wood jo uh, Johnson Foundation. And this allows you to compare not only uh, your state to other states or uh, your county to other counties, but you can compare, uh, for instance, Harris County, uh, where I happen to be, uh, compared to um, LA. So you can compare across states, you can compare across counties, you can look at historically how your county has done, and you can see several different factors that may impact that. So that's another great source for you to utilize. Um, and then a, uh, a, the final option I have for you guys is I source data from CMS and put together a uh, dashboard that shows um, opiate Part D prescription 
um, data from calendar year 2013 through 2016. And what this data shows us is um, not only how many total prescriptions for opiates were, were given, but also uh, the percentage of total prescriptions that were opiates. So if uh, there were, you know, um, 15 million prescriptions written in a state and, and how many of those uh, 15 million were for opiates. So that's, that's some good data to look at. And I broke it down by state and then I broke it down um, by zip code. So you can drill down into your specific zip code. And then I looked at provider types, so the type of provider that's actually um, writing the prescription um, or administering um, this, uh, the, the opiate product. Um, to the uh, Medicare patient. So just bear in mind that, you know, while uh, internal medicine or family uh, practice physicians may have a higher volume, um, overall their percentage of, of opiate administration prescriptions is a lot lower than say a pain management physician because they primarily focus at, uh, on treating pain management. Of course, I'll link these uh, dashboards and data sources. Feel free to check them out. And of course, feel free to also share this video, provide me with any feedback or comments that you may have. Thank you.